All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Hi. All right, so uh, just remember uh, for the OTO people, there's uh, the exam tomorrow. That's what we're working on in the morning. And then uh, for us in the 120, all right, we're going to finish up the, the probability chapter tomorrow. And then, uh, I'm sorry, not the statistics test material tomorrow. And we're going to have a test next week, which is the 16th. Okay, which is Tuesday. Now, there's also the test for the take-home one, the one that I didn't have enough time to give you before the midterm it was covered on the midterm so that thing is open now and then you have until uh thursday class time to finish it you got three attempts on it so next tuesday will be the review right not the actual for what uh, 120 uh, next Tuesday. You say Let me check the dates. Okay, 15th is Monday. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I got, uh, yeah, the Monday is the review, yes. Okay. See. All right, so Monday the review and the 16th is the, the actual. Yeah, the uh, I don't know why I thought it was a 17. 
Well, there's no more time we, uh, left. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. The the 17th is the last day of class. Because uh, um, we don't have any uh, classes. Wednesday's the last day of class, but Thursday the exam is scheduled. So it's a short week as far as formal meetings are concerned, like the you know the tr the ones we've been having. But uh, you're going to have the exam in there. So any questions about that? Everybody uh, on board with all that? After the exam tomorrow in the O two O, if there's anybody, I know there's a couple of people that don't, justice is not in that class, then um, all the attention in that class will be just towards the review. It'll be very informal in the morning. All right, so let's see if we can get as much done as we can can we might be able to finish up but uh i don't want to do too fast all right so yesterday we uh had talked about graphs and such the graphs of uh statistical graphs which mainly you're talking about the histogram which is created from a frequency distribution uh there are other types of little graphs too but not nearly as important as that one So uh, now we're getting into calculations now, number crunching. And then the first thing that we're looking at is the measures of central tendency. <clears throat> Data, by its very nature, we want to find out where the middle of the data set is. And we do that by looking at three different measures. There's a fourth one that they may mention in... in um, Newton like mid range, but it's very, very uh, easy calculation and it's not really that important. But some books feel the need to put it in there. Okay, so now let's. All right, so let's just briefly go back and, and just uh, refresh our mind about the mean. The mean, uh, there's two different symbols for the mean, but it's really the same calculation. The population mean deals with when you've got all of the data set, and the sample is when you're just dealing with a subset. All right, and just to show you... It looks like this is the symbol, mu. It's a Greek symbol. And then this one, X bar, is what we use for sample. But they're both the same exact calculation. Because as you can see up there, it looks sort of like this. And this is another weird Greek symbol. That right there is the universal mass symbol for sum them up, add up. So what that means is there's a fraction there. So in the numerator, we add up all the values and then we divide by the total number of values. And you see the same thing over here. They just use the little n for sample. But that's the same n that we've been dealing with throughout. It's the count. All right. So let's just do this one real quick. Five. We already did it, but let's get it real quick. Just to make sure we understand it now when our minds are fresh. So I'm just adding all those up. And then I'm going to divide by six because there's six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. So all of those up at the top add up to 60. 
And if we divide by 6, that means that our mean is 10. So essentially what this is telling us as far as what this means is 10 is the middle of the data set, mean-wise. And it takes every one of the data values into account. See that? It's all of them. So what happens here is if we have, um, and, and I bet you most people know about this that are students. What happens if you have three test grades, let's say you got uh, 83, an 85, and an 87, and then you have a bad test and you score a 30. What happens when we, uh, to your average, to your mean, when you uh, have one low score versus high scores? brings you down right yes i was just about to say one that. grade will bring yeah one grade will bring you down it works the other way too if you have a b uh or let's say, say a c average with three tests all grades in the 70 and you uh, score 100 or nearly 100 then that's going to shoot your score upwards so the mean takes every one of the values into account and it's what we call sensitive to outliers. And an outlier is just an extreme value, like a low grade or a high grade. So let me write that here. I probably got it written you know, in my definitions and all that, but mean is sensitive to outliers. Well, let me just put extreme values, which is the same thing. Since it uses all values to calculate. Okay. Now, the median is different. The median, mean, M-E-A-N, median. It's a value that's in the middle of a ranked data set. When I say ranked, it means that all the values are sorted and high, uh, low to high, and then it'll be the value in the middle. All right, so let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this. I'll let you read it because I want to kind of explain it because this right here, I think it doesn't just do, do, uh, do justice to explain sometimes, but I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let's say we've got this same data set right here. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to put one more value in there. Okay, so these right here, notice that they're already sorted, 5, 7, 10, 11, 12, 15, and 16. Now, with the median, what we have is the middle value. It's already ranked, sorted low to high. So the value that's in the middle, which in this case is the 11, would be the median. But if we have no middle value, which is possible because in this case, I added an extra one there to create a middle value. Because if I don't have a middle value, then what I got is I got two middle values. All right. So what I got to do is I got to add up the 10 and the uh, 11, the two middle values. And then I'm going to just do what we did with the mean, which is divide by two. So this is 21 divided by two, which would be 10.5. Okay, so that's all this is talking about. If you want a formula, then that's the formula. Whatever your N is, in other words, Six pieces of data plus one divided by two would tell you where the median is at. 
Now, it does not work so well when it's even, and that's why I don't like reducing it to formulas. So what they do here is they throw in some more terms that if it's an even number of pieces of data, then you look for the middle value between n over 2 and n over 2 plus 1. So in this case here, which was the original one, so there were seven values. So 7 plus 1 is 8. 8 divided by 2 is 4. So this is the fourth position. So that's where your median is at. That's what this is saying right there. 1, 2, 3, 4. Because 7 plus 1 is 8. 8 divided by 2 is 4. So that tells us what position the median is in. It does not tell us the median. It just tells us the position. So there's another step after you calculate. And then if it's even like this one was, then it's in between n over 2, which was in this case, it was uh, 6 over 2. So that would be the third position and 3 plus 1 in the fourth position. So if it's an even number of pieces of data, then you just simply got to um, add up the two middle ones and divide by two. Now the mode is really easy because the mode is just the piece of data that occurs most frequently. You can have one mode, you can have multiple modes, or you can have no modes if all your data is unique. All right, let's try some of these. Let's try the uh, mode. So this data right here, we've got two ones, two, three twos. We got four, four fours and two fives. The one that repeats the most often is the mode, which in this case is four because there's four of them. Notice on this right here, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, and 12, they're all unique. So there is no mode. And on this one, we've got 2 1s, 2 2s, and 2 3s. See? 2, 2, and two, so there is no clear winner, so it's a tie between one, two, and three. So no mode, that's when they're all unique, nothing wins, nothing repeats more than any of the other ones, and uh, the, or the one that repeats the most in that case, or one where there's a tie, essentially. So uh, let's go up here to, to uh, I'll come back to that in a little bit. But I want to talk about the measures of variation now, just in contrast to the measures of central tendency. Measures of, va of variation simply tells us how spread out the data is. In other words, we could have a data set where it's like all uh, clumped together, a skinny one. You can have one that's real skinny, or you can have one real spread out. So what the, uh, the measures of variation, and the most famous one is the standard deviation. The sm standard deviation for this one would be smaller than that one. Okay. Well, let's talk about the range first. The range is a very simple one. It's not very useful, but it uh, can help us figure out something about how spread out of the data and I'll show you what I mean. So um, here's the temperatures for San Francisco throughout the year. They're just average temperatures, not highs or lows. And you'll see that in January it's 51 and then it gets starts getting warmer. And then towards the summer, it starts getting up into the 60s. And then it starts coming back down again come October and into December. 
and it almost ends up being the same temperature that it was in January. Well, the range for this is simply the highest one minus the lowest one. So the range for this data set, this data set that represents average temperatures in San Francisco is 12, meaning that there is only a variation of 12 degrees throughout the year. 12 degrees is the most change you'll see. Let's contrast that with our home city. Okay. So on this one, uh, the high is 82 July and August, <clears throat> 82. And then the low is in uh, January, 51. 82 minus 51 is 31. So that right there is more than twice the spread of the data in San Francisco or the temperature in San Francisco. So this range can be used just to give a general idea of how spread out the data is. It's more for uh, helping us understand like I said, it is. it's not that useful as far as data sets is concerned and doing statistics. And that's what this one is for, the standard deviation. Now, as I had said before, you can have all kinds of data spreads. You can have very skinny, like this one right here. It tells that the standard deviation is 0.5. The mean uh, is 2. That's It's out here on the 2. The blue one the standard deviation is one. That's the generally the, the middle case right there. Though. In other words, the basic one, standard deviation of one. And then the mean is zero, because it's on the X is equal to zero. This one is spread out even further, the green one. Notice that the standard deviation here, they tell us that, that it's two. And because of this one that's moved over to uh, the mean is actually negative two. And you can see it also in that one there where they're all put together. Mainly, I just want you to understand when you're talking about standard deviation, you're talking about how far the data is spread out. And the range is a real simple snapshot of that because you take the largest and subtract the smallest. But the standard deviation by the value that it gives us, in other words, one, it means that it's kind of more or less right in the middle. And then as the standard deviation gets smaller, the data is less spread out. And as the standard deviation gets larger, it's more spread out. Now, there's two different standard deviations, just like there is for the mean. The only problem here is the calculations are not exactly the same. There's one small difference. Have you ever done any of those like puzzles where it says, can you spot the difference? Well, there's the big difference. For a sample, for a sample, we have to subtract one from the number of pieces of data that we got. For the population, if we have a population, then we don't need to worry about that. The reason why we subtract one, it's just that if we're dealing with a sample, we have to allow for a certain amount of error. All right, so let's see how we do this. All right, now the way I handle this is I like to have a little chart. And I'm going to put my values here. Does it matter about the order? Now, so this is what we call X. We're using the sample. So we're going to take and subtract the mean from each one of these. 
Now, we got to find out what the mean is. So let's add up all of these. So uh, here, the X bar is going to be all of those added up. So 8 plus 10 plus 13 plus 11 plus 6 plus 6. So that's 54. And there are six values, so we're going to divide by 6. And so the mean is 9. Meaning that the middle of the data set is 9. Now, what the standard deviation does is it's basically we're talking about how far from the mean it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to go here and we're going to subtract the mean from each one of these. And another one exactly the same. Now, the sign is very important here. That's why we're subtracting the mean from all of them. So 8 minus 9 is equal to negative 1. 10 minus 9 is just 1. 13 minus 9 is 4. 11 minus 9 is 2. 6 minus 9 is negative 3, and we got two of those because that's the exact same value there. We'll make another column. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of finish writing the formula. And this is all squared. So these values here, all of these right here, these are what we call the deviations, the x minus x bar. This tells us how far from the mean each one of the data values are. And now what we're going to do is we're going to square each one of those. And if it's negative, it gets squared. And when we square positive or negative, we always end up with a positive value. Because we're multiplying negative 1 times negative 1, which would be positive 1. Same as this one. 4 squared is 16. 4. 9. And then we get another one right here. Exactly the same. All right. So that whole top right there, see it has another sum thing in there. We've done the part here, the x minus x bar squared. So what that sum means is just to add them up. Add them up. So 1 plus 1 plus 16 plus 4 plus 9 plus 9 is 40. So that 40 is the whole top up there. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 40. So our S here is equal to the square root of 40. And down here is the N minus 1. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 pieces of data. So we're going to subtract 1. So this is a sample. we got to just be conscious of error. And that's why we do that. All right. So uh, 
I don't think I got. Yeah, this has got a square root key. So it's uh. Forty divided by five. Six minus one is five, and it's eight. So the square root of eight. And then we're going to have to approximate it because it's uh, square roots generally are like that. So two point eight two. We're going to go to two two decimal places. So two point eight three. All right, so this is the the most intensive calculation in this whole chapter. It's got a lot of steps, so don't be afraid if you under you know got questions because it's a bear, bear of a um, problem as far as calculations are concerned. So for this one right down here, the mu, which is this the same thing, the mean is 26. You add all those up, you get 156, you divide it by six, six pieces of data, you get 26. All right. So now we're going to do another one for this population. I'm gonna push it over here. So here's our X and then we're gonna just put all of these values. Order doesn't matter. All right, so here's going to be x minus mu, which is the exact same calculation as the x minus x bar. It's just we're dealing with a population here. So let's just do what this. So 24 minus 26 is... Negative two, so there's two of those. 26 minus 26 is zero. 20 minus 26 is three. We got another 26, which is another zero. And 27 minus 26 is just a one. So there are our, what we call deviations, what they're called. How far the piece of data is from the mean. So now up here, we're going to square each one of those. So negative four, uh, negative two squared is four. You got two of them. Zero squared is zero. Three squared is nine. Zero squared is zero. And one squared is one. And this is uh, 16, isn't it? Something that bothers me about that. All right. So there's our top. That's this part right up here, the sum of the squares. So that right there just means sigma. It's a Greek symbol, but you just know that that means 
population standard deviation. And then there's six, right? Let's just let's see if we can do this. Sixteen divided by six. No, let's not do that. I don't want to round it off yet. Whenever you're dealing with uh, statistics, and even in probability, you don't round off until the very end. If it comes out to where it's exact, you don't have to worry about it. Let's see. This would be eight thirds, right? Half of sixteen is eight. Half of six is three. So now what I'm going to do is square root 8 divided by, so square root of that, so approximately 1.63. You always wait to round off on your last step. Don't ever round off. They'll give you some kind of instruction like round off to to the tenth. Um, I'm sorry, to the tenths or to the third decimal place, whatever they're asking. Remember, don't round off until you get to the very end. That's the most uh, common mistake that I see in statistics is because we got to round the answer off often, but we don't round off until the last. So you always go a few decimal places beyond, or you keep it exact the way I did that, eight. And then here it was eight thirds. So that's your standard deviation. That's your standard deviation. All right, let's go back up here for this thing. All right. So if you got data that's in a frequency table, and I'll find this one. So this is good right here. Let's make sure all that out. Actually, I want something that I got a white background if I can get. No, I don't guess anybody's going to have something like that here. We'll figure out how to do it. All right. So what I'm going to do, here's the formula that they give you. X bar is equal to, on the numerator, it's the, free, uh, the summation of the frequencies times X. All right, I'll show you what that means. And then that's the summation of the frequencies you're dividing in. The problem when you got something, data that's in a frequency table or frequency distribution, is that you don't know exactly what the values are. So this is just a way to approximate it. So first step then is we're going to multiply these two values. All right, we're going to take 139 times one, 145 times two, 150 times two, 136 times one, 152 times one, 
So you kind of trying to get your data back because if you got it in a frequency table, you don't know exactly necessarily what they are. In this case, you do, but because you know the exact heights, but this is the way you do it. If you do it with, uh, I'll show you one more thing in a second. I've finished this because you may have to find a midpoint. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and we'll, we'll use our calculator to multiply the ones that we need. And I'm gonna go over here in my little whiteboard place. So I got a whiteboard. So this is gonna be All right, 145. So that, that's 290, isn't it? I'm trying not to break out the calculator yet. Okay, I just wanted to see. They don't have them in order. But... I think this is 278. Oh. Let me do the calculator. Two seventy six. All right. So this right here, if we sum all these up, this is the summation of F times X. So this is, um, X and this is F. So this is X times F. So the summation of X. Times F. Well, let's just add all those up. 276 plus 144 plus 152 plus 136 plus 300 plus 290 plus 139. So that means then the sum of the X times the frequencies. This is very similar to what you were doing when you do the, um, the expected value. Same thing. All right. So the mean for this. So the mean is equal to 1,437 divided by the sum of the frequency. I'm sorry, the sum of the, uh, yeah, sum of the frequencies. So remember, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing that. The sum of F times X, which is what that is up there. Up there. So the sum of the frequencies then is simply then the sum of all those numbers. In other words, the, the left hand, uh, the right hand side.
one plus two plus two plus one plus one plus two. So there, like there was nine. I'm going to come back and check. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It looks like it's 10. Let me double check, triple check it. What did I do here? One plus two plus two. Oh, I missed one of the ones. Okay. So one, four, three, seven divided by 10 equal to, so this mean is equal to 143.7. There's no need to round this unless, oh, so then, because this one is exact, because it stops, there's no values coming after it. So 143.7, in other words, what that tells us is 143.7 is right around 144. So these are in order. I just noticed that as we were doing it. But the mean would be one around 144. But it's, that's the exact value. I just was trying to show you for the sake of explanation that it tells you where the middle of the data is. Now, let's say we want to find a midpoint because uh, this is, I need to tell you this in order to do, because uh, there's really, this is what we call the, un, the uh, non-group data because the, the values were already in existence. We didn't have to create any classes. The classes were created for us. But let's just say we didn't have data like that. Let's say find one that's not too long. Well, we got plenty of time. Okay. And this one's already got the frequency added up for us, too, so we're in luck. All right. Now, here, this right here is what we talked about yesterday. These are called classes. They call it category, but it's in, as far as we're concerned, it's a class. But what that means is that the va any values that fall in the range of, you know what? I'm not going to use that one because this one is just, a, there's something else they did on this one I don't like. Let me find us another one. All right, here. This is better. We don't need to tally mark, but it gives us a lot of room to write. So, all right. So now, here's a, a problem you might have noticed. On this one, on the one we had over here, this one, well, there was a value there to multiply because it's what we call non-group data. In other words, it's all grouped for us nice, neatly. We didn't have to do anything. But if we have to create classes, here, like this has, then there's not one number. So what number do we multiply? For a class, we find the midpoint of each. Okay, and then that's going to give us the one number. So I'm going to go ahead. So I'm going to just write that here midpoint all 
All right, so what am I going to do? Well, watch. It's really simple. It's really just adding up and dividing by two on each one of them. It's just doing you mean. So I'm going to add up 41 plus 49. So that's 90. And I'm going to divide that by two. And you know what that means? That means here our midpoint is 45. All right. Now watch this little bit of magic here. Now, how many values are in there? For that first class, we got 41, 42, 43, 40, 44. All right, so how many values is that? There should be nine of them, but let's check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine values in there. So the middle of this nine values is 45. As you can see there, we just calculated it by adding up those two endpoints and dividing by two. Now, the class width is nine, so here's a little bit more magic. We could go ahead and add up 58. And 50, and then divide by 2, and so 54. But watch what we can do with, since we've done the first one, and we know the class width now. 45 plus 9 is 54. 54 plus 9 is 63. 63 plus 9 is 72. And then this one's 81. So you could just add up the endpoints on all of them and divide by 2. But I did want to show you the relationship of classes here that you can just add 9 once you know that class width. Because this thing is perfectly kind of tuned. Anytime you've got a frequency distribution, then it's got certain rules it's playing by. All right. And then that's why a histogram is the, by far one of the most important graphs of statistics because it's got all the, um, the bars the same size like this here. The, the class widths are all nine. So that means when we draw a graph of this, each one of the bars will be that same width. So now, um, let's do the same thing. 45, well, let's put it over here. 45 times 3, 54 times 6, 63. Uh, Okay, so let's just do that with the calculator uh, real quick. We're almost done here. So 135. And this is your X times F again. Because, see, this was your frequency, and then this was your X. We just had to make an X by creating the midpoint. Sixty-three times five. Sixty-three times...
Okay, so then uh, this is the sum of the frequencies. We've already got that. So we've got to add all these up. Let me go back over here to the white. All right, so this is... Uh, so we found out that the sum of the frequencies... was 22 so this was three what was that one i might as well write them in there because i didn't uh bring them over six five six two six five six two so the sum of the frequencies which is these right here is 22. This one would be the sum of the x times the f's. And that's going to be our numerator. So that's 1368. So then the sum, um, the x bar. Well, let's try to just say mean. We don't need to dis distinguish between the two here. It's just the mean. Same calculation. So now, let's divide that by 22, and we got 62.2. And that one is rounded, okay? I'm rounding it to the, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I was rounding it to uh, hundreds. So 62.18. And that's what this means. All right. Well, so let me know if you get any questions about that. I'm not going to go. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to just give you a few minutes, and then I'm going to go. It's just kind of a visual. But if there's any questions on this, we're pretty much done. I just want to uh, explain one thing about tomorrow. I'd just like to give a little lead in. As I had told you. When we were uh, when we had my notes about the uh, these different ones, well, from the rest of the chorus, which is just tomorrow and until we have our test next week, we are just worried about one. Okay, it's called different things. Some people might call it the bell curve, but it's standard normal distribution is what it is technically. All right. So um, the mean is in the middle. That's zero right there. Okay, that's what the mean is. So if data is shaped like this, it's what we call normal distribution. And without doing a whole lot of calculations, we can find things out rather quickly. And then each one of these hops over here is a standard deviation of one. That's why it's called the standard normal. You can feasibly have data sets with, with the uh, means and standard deviations that are not zero and one, but you use this thing called the z-score to convert it. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. So there's three standard deviations above the mean of, and three standard deviations below the mean. And that's why they have a negative sign there. Just to indicate that that's below the mean. 
so that's what we're all everything else is focused on this starting tomorrow that's the rest of the course is standard normal distribution and being able to find uh how much area is between or more than or less than however many standard deviations we're just going to find out that whole area underneath there is equal to one And that one is the probability that we just got finished with. A probability, the maximum that it can ever be, is one. So everything underneath that curve is adds up to one. So we just want to find out probabilities using statistical calculations is all this is. All right, so that's probably enough. If you got any questions, let me know. I'm here, stick around here for a few minutes. Otherwise, I will see you tomorrow. Remember that, uh, Leonza, Brandy, Chantel, remember that exam tomorrow, okay? Okay. You don't have to come to class, but check in with me, okay? Let me know if everything's going all right. Tomorrow. Okay, starting at 11, right? Okay. Yeah, it's open from it's open during class time, but you don't you don't have to zoom because I don't think you can anyway. <laughs> so just check in with me. Let me know beforehand everything's okay. Okay, I sure will. So that way I'll feel a bit better. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hmm. Okay, Lorenzo.